Q Choir as we remember our Lord's suffering for us to give us life eternal. And let us stand as we look at God's Word. We're looking at Psalm 25. It's found on page 492 in your Pew Bible. And uh, I, I thought it was appropriate. Uh, there's a couple of Psalms I was looking at this week as we look at this and, and taking a break from our series from Luke as Christ has turned now to the cross and there, there's opposition rising against him. Uh, but uh, I thought we'd look at Psalm 25. Hear God's word as we look at it together. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without a cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness. For they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to your mercies, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. To such as keep his covenant and his testimony. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The seeker of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you redeem O God redeem Israel O God out of all their troubles the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God stands forever well please be seated well brothers and sisters in Christ I was kind of thinking about all the things that the fears that have been pushed on the world even in my brief life but I wonder if there's any, been any time since World War II that the world has been filled with such fear and turmoil even as it is now. Because trials and crises always shape the status quo. They reveal far too many have trusted in worthless things, exchanging the truth for a lie, worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. It shows us the reality of our life. We are not the masters of our own destiny. Even now, what's happening? People cling to worthless things for security. Something to give them a little, little hope, uh, to ease the pain. What's the one thing you went to the store maybe this week needing because you ran out? And it's not at the stores either. It's toilet paper. Now, being prepared is not a sin. Joseph, by God's direction, called the nation of Egypt to prepare for famines. But as Christians, our preparation is not stashing up as much toilet paper as we can have. It, it's that when troubles strike, when the, when the world in faithlessness is turned upside down, we have to turn to the sovereign God of heaven and earth through his Son. Because the scripture reminds us, even if, if maybe our foot has been slipping for a time, that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And it's here in his word that we find in Psalm 25, the Holy Spirit through David, he, he uses the, the Hebrew alphabet, the ABCs of Hebrew, if you will. He even skips a couple letters and moves one around to call our attention to how we face troubles in this life. 
Even calling our attention to verse 18 and 22, which kind of seem to be maybe some of the central things on this psalm, focusing on the repeated pleas for deliverance, wisdom, and the forgiveness of sins, calling us to seek those things in times like this. Because see, David recognized, as we should, because often God can bring enemies and trials into our life to drive an individual and even a nation to repent, to turn to him. And I want to look at this today not so much in an outline fashion because of some of the chiastic structure in here, but I want to look at some main themes. And particularly under the terms that we seek the Lord in difficult and frightening situations. We must do that. Recognize, recognize our sins and our shortcomings. And lastly, we must seek the Lord for wisdom and deliverance so that he gets the glory. We begin with where the Spirit, Holy Spirit through David teaches us to begin. Bring us back to gospel sanity. That we must seek the Lord as we face difficult and frightening situations. David prays in verse 1, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust you. In you. David is facing frightening, violent enemies. And what does he do? He confesses his confidence in God as we must. Think about it. What has Christ promised us? Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Do you have peace today? It's only going to be found in Christ. And Jesus says this, in the world you will have tribulations. There will be problems. It, there's nothing new under the sun. In this fallen world, we're always moved from trial to trial, problem to problem. And, and yet, while David prays, though, let not my enemies uh, triumph over me, what does Jesus promise? We have the fuller revelation. We understand far more because Jesus promised. Even as he says, in the world you have tribulations, he says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, David's enemies and the enemies of our soul want us to be ashamed. Just like with David. They want us to think that repentance and trust in God is useless. Think about David. He this is not, he's not speaking hypothetical. Verse 15, it, he, he infers that his feet were already in the net. Verse 16 through 18, he tells us he is alone, he is afflicted, in pain, with things going from bad to worse. He is overwhelmed and in distress. There's enemies and frightening situations all around him. And what do those things do to us? Let me ask you, who are your enemies today? You know, many can't get past a microscopic virus right now. But the scripture shows our greatest enemy as we walk this path of life is sin. Which the devil, the world, and even our own flesh use against us. And while the devil and the world <coughs> oppose the things of God and his people, the most difficult enemy sometimes is that of our own flesh, our own hearts. The sins and temptations we struggle with. Not giving God first place in our life. Instead of trusting ourselves trying to make a name for ourselves, trying to get pleasure for ourselves, striving for what the world calls success. Uh, uh, maybe it's just other things, a critical spirit, storing up our treasures on this earth rather than in heaven. But here's the thing. Scripture tells us sin brings death, but here also is our sure hope. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what do we do in trouble? We need to pray to God. Almost half of the Psalms deal with prayer to God in the face of enemies. Is what our nation and the world facing unique? No. It really isn't. Why does a psalmist preoccupy his time? Uh, 72 <coughs> Psalms out of 150? Why is there that preoccupation? Because ultimately, 
The salvation we need is found in God alone. And it's the one that he provides for our body and our soul. David in trust declares, you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. I don't just wait when troubles hit. All day long I do this. David humbly waited on God in faith. Not, not passively even sitting there, but, but wrestling with God in prayer and with his word, with his promises, as we must. He was rehearsing God's word and rehearsing who God is, reminding his own heart of that. He was reminding himself of, of God's tender mercies and loving kindness. See, God will often make us despair of anything in us or the world so that we would seek and trust him for everything as really we're called to do from the very beginning. Isaiah 26, 4 commands, trust in the Lord forever for in Yahweh the Lord is everlasting strength. Are you weak today? We are. Our strength is in God, though. And we show a God-given faith by seeking the Lord in prayer, who Psalm 20 even tells us, he saves his anointed and answers from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. This does not mean God will keep us from every trial or trouble. But the rest of the scripture shows he will always use them to our benefit, to the benefit of his people. Because he'll draw us closer to himself in them. Until the day he brings us to heaven. And that's important because we have heaven and hell before us. And what are we called to do? Well, look at verse 13. David speaks of what we should do. He, he, he speaks of us as, as fearing the Lord in this psalm over and over. But when you fear the Lord, what is it? Well, there's nothing else to fear, is there? So verse 13, David speaks of himself as dwelling in prosperity. Literally, he's spending the night in good. That's literally what it's saying there. In other words, as the storms rage around us, our souls rest in the goodness of God, who is our refuge for eternal life. And he's that refuge because all of your sins and mine have been paid for in Christ Jesus. That's our confidence when we repent. And that really brings us to the second thing, second point here, that we must recognize sometimes our sins and our shortcomings bring us into difficult situations. David in verse 7 prays, Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. This is inferring David is older. He's probably likely thinking, most likely thinking of, or I should say more prominently thinking of his adultery with Bathsheba and then the murder of her husband, Uriah. And there were consequences for this. And remember the Lord told David the sword would not deport, depart from his house. And what ended up happening? Absalom, David's son, raised up an army against his father and David had to flee. Now, nothing is quite so painful as your own child turning against you. In verse 8, he speaks of himself, though recognizing that all these trials reminded him of his sinfulness. Of his continuing sinfulness, even. He speaks of himself as a sinner. Verse 11, he says, For your name's sake, o Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And then in verse 18, he begins, uh, he again says, forgive all my sins. David doesn't say, look at my life now. <laughs> he, like Paul, still remembers I'm the chief of sinners. I still struggle. And so he does what we're called to do. He appeals to the character of God, as we must. Even praying, according to your tender mercies, remember me. And we re when we repent, what's the promise? What did God promise? David. Well, through the prophet, he said, the Lord has put away your sin. 
Consequences remain. Why? Well, the Lord oftentimes allows the consequences of our sins to remain because they humble us. And because of something David actually mentions here, too. Because God is good and upright, he teaches sinners in the way. And often the way God chooses to teach us is by bringing trials on us. To remind us and keep us away from things that we so easily would fall back into. You know, I think one of the most humbling things that I've realized in my life when I sit there and say, you know, the trials of my, my life, you know, I, I uh, you know, um, I, I wouldn't do that again. If I had my life to live again, I wouldn't do that. You ever said that to yourself? You know, my greatest fear is if the Lord let me live my life again, I'd still do the same stupid thing. That's a humbling thing to realize. And God brings us into trials to keep us from those sins again, from keeping and repeating those sins. And God can do that with our individual sins to humble us and bring us to our knees in repentance. And he can do that with national sins. And we should, and you think about it, our nation has many national sins. I could list them. I don't have time this morning. And we should examine our own hearts, asking, are we facing this because of unrepentant sin? And if we are, if we say, Lord, you in my own life, this is my sin, then we need to repent and turn from those sins and even pray for our nation to repent. But here's the thing, too. As Christians, though, then we don't have to dwell on those things. But we look to Christ. Because one of the things, as David is, is going back, talking about God's justice and his mercy, he realizes, and, and he's given a hint of that through the Holy Spirit, that, that that would be resolved, that justice and mercy of God would be resolved by the coming Messiah, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And that's why now in repentance, as believers in Christ, you and I are under the righteous shed blood of Christ for our sins on the cross. He paid for them on the cross. And while trials and troubles can make us painfully aware, as it did of David, of how corrupt we still are, how weak we are, at the same time, we need to thank God for his covenant mercy and great love because he sent his son to bear the penalty for your and my sins. And again, the troubles that we face often remind us of our need for his grace. But we also have to remember too his promise that nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. We've got to argue those things to our heart. Pastor Harry Ironside who died in the 1950s was called to the bed of a dying man who said and the man was panicked. He says, I'm remembering the sins of my youth, and it's dark. And he even added, I, I'm afraid I, I forgot a few. Ironside actually quoted this psalm to him. And he asked, did you pray that? The man said, yes. Ironside talked to him for a while, but replied too, then he has promised to satisfy your problem in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man thought about it for a time, and then he said this, would a fool... I am for remembering what God has forgotten. We need to repent and trust that God forgives us for the sake of Christ, for the sake of his mercy, love and kindness. Well, lastly, seek the Lord, his wisdom and deliverance so he gets the glory as he works for our good in most difficult situations. Even while the devil will try to destroy us by our trials, God's good, overarching, sovereign purpose for his people is that trials make us seek the Lord more intensely. And we see how much more precious his redemption is. David prays, show me, O Lord, teach me your paths. Now, have you ever noticed that at times on the road there's a rut from cars and trucks driving in the same area on the asphalt? You can't. The wheels kind of bounce in and out of that rut. 
Well, in the Hebrew, he's making an allusion to something very similar. And David is asking for wisdom to follow God's path. He prays, lead me in your truth and teach me, for God's ways are not our ways. <laughs> That's why he's praying that. His timing is not our timing. And much more, his ways run contrary to the world and even our own heart. And we need him to lead us. Because as David writes here, good and upright. He's good and upright while we are sinners. We need a trailblazer to show us how to navigate this life. We need someone who knows the path through the black forest of this life. And this guide is ultimately our triune God who also promises to deliver those who fear him. Fear. It means we're shaking, quaking. If we're unrepentant, we should be. But the fear the psalmist is talking about is those who recognize God as holy and almighty and righteous, all-knowing and all-wise. To fear God is, is, is a Christian. To, to, to bow the knee and factor him into every thought and situation, living in the reality of his sovereignty over all of our life. Realizing our life and our times are in his sovereign hands. And that's why even David had the confidence, even though he was not out of the trouble yet, but he could declare, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. And this same God who gives us wisdom is also our deliverer. And understand, this is a biblical deliverance that's being spoken about. Did the enemies of David remain? Yeah, oftentimes they did. And in our life, God will not miraculously heal us or get us out of all problems. It, it's not like we have the sun always shining over our head as Christians. It's not true. Sometimes we suffer the most. Think of how God delivered John the Baptist and Paul from their troubles by bringing them to heaven through violent deaths. And Paul, in faith, wrote, The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You want your best life now? Or you want to be delivered from sin and misery to Christ's presence where there is glory and, and, and joy forevermore? And we need to think about our life differently because often the good God brings us is different than the good we think we need. That trial, whatever it may be that you're facing already today, long before any fear of a virus came about, God is using that in our lives to sanctify us, to separate us from our sin and to draw us closer to him in repentance. To bring us to the point where, where we look for his wisdom and, and, and look to obey him. God will hedge us in at times to bring that about. In fact, you want God to hedge you in. Because if you're not being hedged in, there's other consequences. But God's ultimate goal is to bring his people to himself. Maybe that's why you're here even this morning. Because God's purpose is that ultimately, not that we'll live a charmed life, but where Christ is, we will also be. And that's for our eternal good and his glory as he saves sinners like us from the fear and judgment of hell by the gift of his grace. And our duty is to trust God, even in our troubles, and even, even seeing this as an opportunity to witness to God, to do as, as Jesus spoke about in Luke 13, to call others saying, repent. That's the purpose in this trial. And that's how we witness to others, even if our heart's aching at the same time. Because God is faithful to all of his promises, including to redeem all of Israel, which David ends with, all his chosen people out of their troubles. That's why he sent his son into this troubled, fallen world. 
Or brothers and sisters in Christ, perhaps you've prayed with tears in your eyes and a heavy heart wondering at different times. And maybe, maybe it'll come back to you during these days, too. Asking, why, God, do you allow us to face trouble and pain? We usually ask that question not thinking about our sin, our faithlessness. <laughs> That's why sometimes we can almost accuse or even accuse God of being unfair to us. But is he? <coughs> For family devotions, Luther read from Genesis 22 about Abraham being commanded to offer his son Isaac. Reacting to the intense pain of this trial and, and how unjust it seemed. Katie, his wife, declared, I don't believe it. God would not have treated his son like that. Luther replied, but Katie, he did. See, God sent his sinless only begotten son, Jesus, not to deliver him from every pain, but to bear our griefs, to carry our sorrows, to be smitten by God and afflicted so that by his stripes we might be healed. It's not to protect us from troubles, but to save us and one day set everything right at Christ's return. So that sin and pain and sorrow and trouble and death that it brings will be no more. You wonder what you need? That's what you need. That's what I need. Until that day, God, by this psalm, teaches the ABCs of how to prayerfully face our troubles. Seeking the Lord, recognizing uh, sometimes it's because of our sins and our shortcomings. And also seeking his wisdom and deliverance from him because in the end God will get the glory in it because it will be for our everlasting good all because of his redeeming love and grace in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you would strengthen our souls because of the truth of the matter is what we're facing is nothing new. And even as the apostles said in Acts 14, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So Lord, we pray. As you are the just God, as you will judge the wicked, as you call us to repentance and the hope of uh, of of your grace and forgiveness that's found in Christ alone. We, we come before you confessing our flesh and our heart fail. But Lord, we pray, be the strength of our heart and our portion forever. For you are the merciful God, the Heavenly Father, who has taught us in your word that you do not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. And so we pray, look on us with, in, in your mercy. And look at us in these trials and we pray, have your perfect work. Bring us individually to our knees and even this nation so that we might find repentance and find good hope by your grace and peace in you. Give us patience under no matter what trial we face. Understanding your good will, even though we don't understand it. Comfort those who are struggling, Lord. And again, there's so many other trials that are happening right now, even in this very room. Comfort them with a sense of your goodness and compassion. And Lord, strengthen us too in the great hope, because that hope will come, uh, become sight, where one day we will stand before your throne and praise your name joyfully forever. And we will be so pleased, so happy to do that. Because we will see all that you have done for us because of your saving grace and because of your glory in Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let us open up our hymnals now as we offer our tithes and our offerings as we sing hymn number 264. Jesus.